uh, firstly i have uh, uh, i thank you uh, professor and uh, the participants uh, for uh, inviting me here and uh, on uh, this issue of uh, india sri lanka relations uh, if if i am not audible kindly raise your hand no sir you are very clear very clear yeah so i will take it uh, slowly so that yeah, you yeah. uh, is in line with me i am not yeah, going yeah. to go through the pedestrian format of yeah. india sri lanka relations i presume all of us have a basic knowledge and i will proceed with the specifically strategic aspects how it has changed in the last uh, uh, 10 years that there had been a churn up in this strategic scenario it started with uh, the asia pacific becoming indo pacific this transformation the concept of indo pacific security this uh, took place sometime about uh, 10 12 years back because us saw the rise of chinese navy china had a very primitive navy but they made a 50 year plan that is the uh, people's republic of china made a 50 year plan and now in 30 years they are emerging as one of the challengers to the us navy in the pacific for that they have to get out of the south china sea where they are bottled if you see the american bases they are aim at closing all entry points from uh, guam okinawa these american bases and the allies japan south korea together and taiwan together they bottle up any other navy from dominating the south china sea so china is trying to get out of that that is why they have built uh, aircraft carriers they have built uh, otherwise they were only a coastal navy about uh, 30 years on now more than 35 years on the navy has is trying to uh, embark on uh, multiple exercises with the help of soviet uh, russian navy because carrier operation is very tricky thing uh, aircraft carrier operation uh we have been operating for 50 years we have done any number of exercise that gives hands on knowledge which is handed down from generation to generation so it is not just an aircraft carrier would be able to dominate it requires a uh, fleet escort how the escorts will operate it requires submarines to protect it and a whole range of what they call in modern warfare c4 i s r that is command control computers uh, intelligence communicate okay, command control computers communication intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance this is what is the crux of the modern warfare which is networked what do, what do we mean by networked uh, operation it is controlled centrally suppose the guy sitting in operational headquarters in pentagon will be able to see exactly if there is an encounter in indian ocean between an us naval ship and a foreign ship 
uh, when I say naval ship, it's warships. He, he will be able to directly access. And it will be real time. That means as we progress, as the operation progresses. Now China embarked on this in 2012. China started what is called informatization. We also are informatizing rather slowly. This uh, command and control setup is the informatization. This is helped by captive satellites for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. We also have that. China, of course, has US very well, very well established. This is how the warfare is fought. So my perspective would be relating to this aspect. So there is no point in looking at india sri lanka relations in isolation. We should see the bilateral, multilateral, and what uh, our foreign minister, Dr. Jayashankar says, plurilateral. That is beyond multilateral with other groups of alliances. So we will examine that. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi, when he came to power in 2014, I will start from that period. I don't want to go to the past history. He introduced two initiatives. Neighborhood first, that is prioritizing India's neighbors who had been neglected because we had been, uh, what you call, uh, either US-centric, China-centric, or Pakistan-centric. We had neglected our neighbors. Long pending issues were there in, uh, with Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and of course, Pakistan. So, he had made, he was the first Prime Minister to visit Sri Lanka after 12 years. He was the first Prime Minister, Indian Prime Minister, to visit Jaffna. I think last visit was in uh, 1932. Nobody has visited, though we have fought wars in uh, the Indian peacekeeping force and the LGT surgeons. I myself was there. I was head of intelligence there. So the, these two initiatives were very timely because China launched a huge initiative as its money power became grew since 2013, President Xi Jinping came to power. He has slowly gathered and been able to dominate the entire political spectrum in China. He is going to be, in, a, in a two months, he is going to be elected probably President, everybody expects that. President for lifetime. That is, after Mao Zedong, he will be the president for lifetime. Because Deng Xiaoping, who after China uh, was in havoc, after cultural revolution, then introduced modern reform of restructuring the Chinese army removing Maoist elements, modernizing, allowing uh, private capital so that China grows. That is how China became a global power clocking average of 12% growth. That next, uh, till uh, recent, when uh, COVID uh, stuck, 2019 onward, there had been, China's growth had been 
receding. Even now, China is the biggest challenger. It overtook Japan as the most powerful economy sometime in uh, about uh, eight years back. Now it is challenging the US. India also has kept pace. You must remember that. We have not kept quiet in our own way, in a democratic way, which may not be as spectacular as it is. We have kept pace and advanced. Our growth is now clocking uh, according to uh, uh, the latest World Bank thing. It is going to be 9%, at least between 85 and 9%, according to global ratings. So China had a setback because China had a COVID and its trade came to a grinding halt because the its uh, efforts to advance its interests globally came with a package of uh, what you call BRI, Belt Road Initiative, that is called. It had 20th century uh, it had 20th century maritime road also as a sub project. The Belt and Road Initiative advanced Chinese capital to upgrade infrastructure in South Asia, where India has been overwhelming influence, cultural, political, commercial, trade, security uh, dominance from Afghanistan on the West to uh, you can include Burma also on the East from uh, the Tibet, parts of Central Asia down to Sri Lanka and other island states of Indian Ocean. India had been dominating. Indian Navy had been the unchallenged uh, power in Indian Ocean. So, Chinese Navy about uh, 10 years back started entering Indian Ocean. Initially, they came to protect Chinese uh, convoys, both up and down convoys from ostensibly from pirates. India also had been doing, actually 12 nations have been involved in this anti-piracy operations. This provided an exposure to the Chinese Navy. Otherwise it was a very uh, elementary coastal Navy. So the, it was able to survey the routes. The, the slowly the bigger, now at any time there are about 12 ships operating, Chinese ships operating in Indian Ocean. Well, when I say 12 ships, they are warships. I am not including commercial ships. China has got one of the highest tonnage of maritime trade ships, cargo ships. So at any time, this, not only this, they were able to sign strategic security agreements with Pakistan by including it, what you call the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Infrastructure Complex, which included Gwadar Port in Balochistan, the development of Balochistan. There, Chinese are firmly established now. They are developing uh, side by side the base for uh, Chinese Navy also. Now they are operating in Djibouti, that is on uh, the, as you enter Africa, the, in Eritrea, 
on the north and Ethiopia on the south. On the tip, it is a very dominant point. From there, they have established a, a base there. They have these. Already French are there. The Americans are there, both there in Djibouti as well as in Ethiopia. And uh, in Kenya, already Americans are there, have got an agreement. India, what India has countered this is by uh, coming to an agreement with France. India has got a very strong relationship with France in Europe and Russia. So our equipment are always dominated by uh, these two countries. Uh, so with France, we have an agreement for using our mutual basis. Uh, the, in, uh, not only there, in Madagascar also we have, in Mauritius we have, and of course, Sri Lanka, we have an agreement. Uh, why I am mentioning this is, I will look at this in the, sir, with your permission, I will look at it like this, rather than merely focusing on the bilaterals. I will come to bilaterals because this theme of this uh, presentation is Sri Lanka. Uh, so Sri Lanka has a very vital component in this. Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Nepal. In all these three countries, China has made big pouring. They are challenging Indian influence. Sri Lanka has a 2,500-year-old relationship with uh, all these countries and with Sri Lanka. And uh, the, it is made of migrants from uh, India's Bihar, Odisha, uh, Tamil Nadu, some Kerala, and the along with indigenous people. That is what is composed of the Sinhalese language, which is spoken by the dominant ethnic community. Uh, that is Sinhalas. It is derived from Pali. It came along with Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, when it came to South India in Tamil Nadu modern day Tamil Nadu. From there, the Chola kings had uh, conquered part of uh, Sri Lanka, Raja Raja Chola, in the thousand years back, thousand two hundred years back. So he had brought uh, the, a lot of this Indian culture. It was a golden era of Indian culture because Raja Raja Chola actually conquered and spread Hinduism, the East Asia also. That is from, if you go to Cambodia or uh, Indonesia, modern day Indonesia, you will find the, uh, the remnants of this culture, Hindu culture. So there is a lot of commonality between Sri Lanka and uh, India. Language, religion, culture, the Actually, if you see a Sri Lankan and an Indian, you won't be able to distinguish. For that matter, of course, there are many contrived divisive forces which are dividing. So, India had always tried to help Sri Lanka. India had physically intervened twice with troops earlier also before the major intervention in Sri Lanka in uh, 1987. Before that, the, there were two insurrections of the uh, leftist, uh, left communist insurrection, that is Janata Vimukti Parabana. On both occasions, 
the Sri Lankan government sought Indian help. So India sent a battalion of troops to so that the uh, capital is secure. India had done this to Burma also earlier. India, when UNU was threatened by the Korean insurgents, again India sent troops. So India had has, it is a wrong thing to say, India physically intervened only in 1987. Indian troops has the invitation. The, so India, when the Tamil community has, there are actually three types of Tamils in Sri Lanka. You must understand. The Tamil community is about 12% uh, according to past census, but there are about 6% uh, to 8% Indian Tamils who were brought in as plantation labor by British because the Sri Lanka climate was ideal for producing high quality tea and in the already the, uh, the Tamils working in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu highlands in tea plantations, they were brought to cultivate tea. The British brought it in more than 100 years. So there the people of that origin, they continue to be <coughs> Indian Tamils. So when Sri Lanka became independent, India, the Indian citizenship, the Sri Lankan citizenship was denied to them. They said, you go back to India. This was a major issue which was resolved by two signing two agreements in uh, regarding their citizenship, we took back some part of it and rest were given. Uh, uh, they, they have continuously not only given citizenship, the, they have cleverly become an important part of all governments in independent Sri Lanka. You will always find one to two ministers of uh, Indian Tamil origin, people of Indian Indian origin who are participant other than the Tamils in North and East. They are the indigenous Tamil people. The, in addition to that, there is a Tamil speaking Muslim minority. They have, over a period of time, they had migrated for trade as a trading community from uh, Indian coast and they are uh, intermarried with uh, Arabs and along the coast, coastal area, they are settled there, both in west coast and mostly in east coast, around uh, Trincomalee in the eastern province and partly in Ambare in the district, the southern part. The, so, the together, the Tamil-speaking minority form about 20%. But the census figures distinguish them always. Because they are politically different, they have got different perspectives, uh, their own perspectives. In addition to that, there is about a half percent of uh, Malay Muslims, Muslims who had come from the trading community, who had come, Indian uh, Koja community, and the plus other uh, Indian traders. They are around uh, Colombo. 
Colombo and South. Similarly in uh, N pockets. Why I am mentioning this is the this is the composition basically what has happened is Sri Lanka was given voting rights much earlier than any other uh, country. It is the first country in Asia. In 1932, they were given voting rights to elect. At that time, British cleverly uh, divided the country, water, waters, by uh, Tamils, Sinhalese, Moors, they called it. They called the Muslims Moors. And even among Sinhalese, there was uh, up country and the coastal Muslims, low country uh, Sinhalese. Uh, there is some difference because continuous colonial uh, invasion by Portuguese first, they introduced Catholic, uh, Catholicism. Then Dutch came, they brought Dutch Reformed Church, Protestants were converted. So slowly this, uh, the, they made inroads into uh, Buddhism among Sinhalese. That is why uh, you find the name like uh, uh, J W R D Bandarna. Oh, sorry, correction. <laughs> uh, Jayavardhani. That is Julius West Ridgeway Das. Uh, things like this. But they intentionally, when there is a nationalism, wave of nationalism, they changed this. There was a reassertion of Buddhism around the uh, 30s. Similarly, there was the reassertion of Tamil Saivism in, in the north, in Jaffa. Thailand, uh, the other two Theravada countries, that is Thailand and Burma, they sent mission to revive Theravada Buddhism. There are four, uh, what do you call, uh, centers of Buddhism. One belongs to, one traditionally has links with Burmese, Theravada, other with the Thai uh, seeds of Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, and two others locally. This is how the Buddhist nationalism has now become a very important thing because Theravada Buddhists feel they are more conservative. They called, uh, they were called Kinayana. The correct term is Theravada because they are more, they do not believe in the ritualistic uh, Tibetan Buddhism or uh, your Mahayana practices, which is a major force. So this Buddhist revivalism has come after the Tamil insurgency was defeated. We must understand this. this insurgency was defeated. It had a 30 year spell and India intervened in 2013 when there was a program carried out by with the tacit support of the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, uh, Jayavardhana at that time, anti-Tamil riots in Colombo particularly. After 13 soldiers were killed by Prabhakaran and company, who were a small outfit, at that time by attacking a Sri Lankan military convoy. Till then, it was a very small affair because before that, what happened is in politics from 1956 onwards, 
the education was changed to Sinhalese medium and Tamil medium. If you are a Tamil, you will learn. Education was in Tamil medium. If you are Sinhalese, you will learn in Sinhalese medium. And English was optional. So there was no bridge. So in 1956, there was the so-called Sri Porat agitation was launched when they said all name plates would be in uh, vehicles would be written in Sinhala only. Sinhala only was made the national language. And colonization of uh, what is called the traditional habitations of Tamils was taking place with Sinhala migrants. That was in the present uh, northern province. So this became a political agitation in the, after the 1972 constitution. Uh, the, it provided a house of 225 members of Sri Lanka, elected a prime minister and there was a governor general. But after Sri Lanka became a republic, the, there was a nominal president and the federal party, mainly of Tamils, led by Dr. S.J. Selvanayagam. Uh, he himself is a Christian, but there is not much difference culturally between the Christians and uh, Hindus. Uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, as also in Tamil Nadu, many other parts of India. So, the he took up there should be a federal form of setup. Otherwise, it was unitary. The districts were, admi were directly administered by what is called a GA, like our district commission. It was the government agent and uh, it was administered through them. So the centrally uh, administered things don't address our issues. They want put forth that we should get representation in a federal setup. Government did not agree. So the talks failed and slowly the, the, uh, the Tamil political parties, they united and formed Tamil, Tamil United Liberation Front because they said, unless Tamils have an independent state, we will not be able to protect our habitations, our culture, our language and identity. This was not acceptable this is the reason for 2013 program when the, the moms of Sri Lankan thugs were let loose on Tamil areas. Actually, Colombo itself has got well, the, the Sinhalese are a minority. The others are a majority. The, uh, the, there is a strong Muslim, Tamil speaking Muslim and uh, Northern Tamils. They are the mostly businessmen. They form the bulk of it. So it was let loose and nearly uh, roughly about 2 lakh people fled from uh, Colombo. And the uh, India at that time, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister and she had her own strategic priorities. She did not want Americans to get a foothold in Sri Lanka. At that time, Americans were at the peak of Cold War because in 19... 
80 they were they were strongly the soviet forces were intervening when najibullah's force the government in afghanistan was collapsing so the at that time indira gandhi who had a treaty agreement friendship and agreement with soviet union was under compulsion not to allow Americans to get a foothold. Uh, this is my own perception. It is uh, supported by Indo-Sri Lanka agreement, which mentions this, that foreign installations in Trincomalee and or any other, anywhere else will not be allowed. Both countries agree. Because Americans were ostensibly establishing a radio communication center which was to eavesdrop on the uh, India feared as part of the Cold War extension. So Indraji, what she did, she supported the Tamil uh, uh, groups. There were 33 Tamil groups taking up arms. They had various political mentors in Tamil Nadu politics. For instance, present day uh, DMK, supported the Telo Tamil Ilam Liberation Organization. At that time, one of the major organizations, the Communist Party supported, the, both the Communist Parties supported the Ilam People's Revolutionary Liberation Front and the ADMK supported the LTT. So, India had a hand in training this, training these insurgents, but it was not done by army. It was organized privately, that has its support from the government. These were little tools, and Sri Lanka had a huge crackdown on them. So, India tried to intervene and bring the two together to a discussion table so that politically it can be resolved. Now that the muzzles have been flexed, so this uh, muzzle flexing went on. This is the, in a nutshell, when these talks failed, when these talks failed, uh, that is the Timpu effort and the one in Bangalore, both the efforts failed. When that, the crackdown became very heavy. The Sri Lankan government sealed food supply to the northern province and the peoples were starving and India asked them to, uh, Sri Lanka to lift this. When Sri Lanka refused, it sought assistance from Pakistan and Americans. But both said, we will not be able to intervene because within you are within Indian domain. So forcibly, India carried out uh, air dropping operation of supplies. It was called Operation Pumale. It sent a signal to Sri Lanka that India means business. So there was a agreement, Ambassador uh, Mani Dikshit was there at that time. He uh, worked out an agreement between Jayavardhana and Rajiv Gandhi agreement. 1987 was signed. It had an important class that is the Sri Lanka would not allow any basis for any foreign powers who are inimical to Indian interest. This, has, this makes sense because if you see geographically, India and Sri Lanka are only separated by 40 kilometers. That means I was an artillery man 65 war and 
and partly in 71 war. So it is within artillery range. That is, if you fire an artillery from Ramiswaram or even a medium missile, it will hit, hit, you can hit Ambatota with a missile. So Sri Lanka is a natural vanguard for any ocean based invasion of India. Vanguard means the troops in forefront. The main guard is the troops behind. Before that, vanguard will try to dissipate the enemy so that he doesn't attack the main guard. So this is how the operation would have been fought. So India always will not allow this agreement testified and Sri Lanka knows this. So India is actually, India has given value addition to Sri Lankan army, made it a capable force. So Navy is almost 70% trained by India. India has given uh, what you call OPVs, their miniature uh, frigates, you can say. Otherwise, Sri Lankan Navy, during World War, Sri Lankan Navy had one ship. The Royal Ceylon uh, Navy had only one ship. The two not have a warship. So why I am mentioning this is, it is a myth that India suddenly intervened. It had always been Sri Lanka also I had recognized. Particularly Sirmao uh, Bandar Naike, President of Sri Lanka and uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi were very close personal friends. J.R. Jayavardhana was very, he started his career with, uh, he was very impressed with Gandhiji's teachings and the Congress way of gaining independence. So they had a, they, this, uh, they, India has a, what you call a soft power, unmatched by China or any other country. China has a soft power because as soon as it became, China became independent. Sri Lanka had a huge famine. Sri Lanka produces rubber. India also has, has having food shortage. You might remember India had that 483 uh, beat coming. So India had this shortage. So India could not help Sri Lanka much, but they, the PRC, People's Republic of China, signed the agreement, rice per rubber. They had a concessional price they were supplying rice for rubber produced naturally. This till a few years back, this agreement was in force. This created a great influence. So it is not that Chinese have created day before yesterday, come and created a favorable image. And Buddhism is a common factor also, but not with the communists. So, the Chinese used that leverage when <coughs> in the last episode of 2009 uh, Ilam War, <coughs> when the president, president as defense secretary, <coughs> pardon me, his father was one moment. <coughs> India had a, a coalition government, so it could not help Sri Lanka with arms, though India had supplied arms earlier. <coughs> At the crucial fourth episode of war, 
the coalition government, Tamil Nadu uh, was a very important partner of coalition of government. So, <coughs> India could not help. China stepped in. Liberal arms. America also stepped in with providing. India, however, provided intelligence inputs. India has a strong intelligence uh, capability in Sri Lanka and in Sri Lankan based uh, terrorism. So, this uh, it enabled them uh, to help Sri Lanka. So, they were able to destroy totally the LTT, which could not be achieved because earlier presidents could never make up their mind. There was a peace process in 2002 uh, by Norway and Scandinavian countries with backed by 4.8 billion dollars of American aid uh, to so that they come to amicable peace. India did not intervene after 1989 when President Premadasa asked Indian, he won the election based on the promise that he would get the Indians out because no country wants a foreign force in its midst deciding its fate. That is understandable. So after that, India did not intervene. So India missed the strategic opportunity to influence building a peace in Sri Lanka by pressuring the LTT. The Tamil Nadu government had uh, political leaders had applied pressure. LTT might have relented, but they had earlier tacitly supported the LTT. Uh, Tamil Nadu, even when the IPK was fighting. So it is this provided the opportunity for uh, China to make a headway, create a favorable impression. And so when the Belt and Road Initiative came, China intervened, uh, became a major development partner in Sri Lanka. Till 14, 2014, Sri Lanka was neglected. We were doing, of course, we were carrying out development projects. India gave uh, during Dr. Manmohan Singh's period uh, as Prime Minister, India gave help to develop 50,000 houses for the war ravaged northern and eastern province people. Uh, the aid was given, but India did not project itself, make a common cause with Sri Lanka, which has been taken. Now, what has happened? Because my time is <laughs> ending. Uh, so, now what has happened? The Belt and Road Initiative has become a major headache for uh, the US and its Western uh, allies because China is has made an entry even in Europe. That is Azores in uh, Portugal. Greece owes a lot of money to survival. And uh, there China is leasing all these ports in Europe. So, of course, they are merchant ports. But China, we must understand, it's not a democratic country. It is a monolithic, autocratic, communist country. So let us not mix the metaphors. She is going to be there for his lifetime. So we are going to be there with China breathing down our neck. This is what happened. So India has taken a call. Earlier, I told you the Sagar Initiative and the Neighborhood Initiative. It has tried to build relationship with Bangladesh by regularizing the border, uh, which was a very complicated thing because there were uh, 63, what you call, 
isolated pockets of the two countries in each other's territory. So this was trending for a long time. It was drawn and in, uh, India helped Bangladesh economy to pick up and along with US support also. Similarly, India built uh, relations with Seychelles, Mauritius, which had always had a uh, favorable impression with India and uh, defense links both these countries. Actually, both the countries, India helped when there was a coup attempt, both Mauritius and, and of course, Maldives, which is always dependent on India for daily sustenance. When there was a water shortage, Indian naval ships reached within hours in Maldives. Maldives has a freshwater shortage. Similarly, in Sri Lanka, when there was a tsunami, while India also suffered, Indian uh, naval ships provided succor and relief within a matter of three hours, sending a strong message of India's strategic capability. So, India was uh, in this two, after 2014, look east policy was changed to act east policy. Along with that, this neighborhood development also took place. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, China and Pakistan became very close and uh, they signed a strategic uh, security agreement. China has uh, bulk of its weapons because of Afghan war. Americans stopped supplying arms to Pakistan, though they were paying, paying cash, $1.8 billion every year to the army to protect its convoys, to supply convoys to Afghanistan. So, China's Belt and Road Initiative became a strategic linkage for asserting China's economic muzzle along with military power. And Sri Lanka became a pivot, the Ampatota port, and now Colombo port. Colombo has got five terminals. Colombo is the biggest carrier terminal, one of the top 30 ports in the world. 70% of India's carrier uh, are sorted out in Colombo. India is the biggest user of Colombo port. Who is controlling? The Chinese are controlling in partnership with the local uh, uh, Sri Lanka port authority. Who are holding 2% higher shareholding. And they are wholly owned Eastern Carrier Terminal. Sri Lanka is with the Chinese are having. So you can see the strategic implication of and also of Pandota. The President Rajapaksha offered this pet project because it was his constituency to India to develop that port. India uh, carried out a feasibility study. India did not accept. So China stepped in, not only developed, they developed a high-speed high speed expressway, a whole complex of things, and Sri Lanka could not pay. Sri Lanka owes China about $6.4 billion. Uh, loans to service this. Many of them are bank loans, exempt banks, at higher interest. They could not service, so the 99 year lease has been given. Colombo port has been. Uh, Colombo port has been. There had been a reclamation project. This was also a pet project. 263 hectares of land has been reclaimed by the Chinese. And a port city has come, which is going to be a financial hub with uh, competing with, let us say, Hong Kong and Singapore or Dubai. This was the dream. 
and all of them the, they are also holding a lease or uh, the Chinese will be dominating. So we should not see Chinese only in terms of a submarine coming or a warship coming. Of course, our warships go there. Pakistani warships call on Sri Lanka, friendly visits. The Russian ships come. American ships regularly, Americans also carry out exercises. These are all naval diplomacy, we must understand. This is the status. When President Rajapaksha came to power, I will finish in five minutes. The present economy, Sri Lanka is dependent on three things for its economy. One is the tourism industry. It is one of the world's famous tour circuits for foreigners. It has got lovely beaches. If you go fly over Sri Lanka, you can see the emerald waters, particularly in the, along the east coast. And uh, the bulk of the tourists are Indians and uh, Chinese. They were trying to overtake uh, Russians, Israelis and Europeans, of course. So, it is the biggest foreign exchange order. Another biggest foreign exchange order is expatriate Sri Lankan living outside Sri Lanka, particularly in Gulf countries, in Canada, US and whatnot. There is a huge remittance from them. Third is tea industry. Sri Lankan tea is far superior to any other tea. I, I can vouch it is better than our teas. But if you taste it, I have tasted. So, and it is the biggest exporter of tea. Even to India, it is exporting tea which is blended also. Tata have an interest. So Indian companies have an interest in Sri Lanka. India has invested around $2 billion in Sri Lanka. Indians form an important segment, our IT companies. And uh, Ashok Leyland is manufacturing, assembling buses. The Indian Maruti is one of the most popular cars. And uh, otherwise, they were importing second hand uh, cars from China, reconditioned cars. So, India has a trade, but what is happening is China is slowly eating into these areas. So, when the tourism remittance tea they collapsed. When, unfortunately, when President Rajapaksha, that is the present president, Gotabaya Rajapaksha, his brother who was Mahinda Rajapaksha, was the one responsible for, uh, he had two tenures, he finished LTT. So the family became very famous. Now, since he had done according to constitution, you can't have third term. So his brother, Gotabaya, who was defense secretary, assumed power. He is in power. And he started implementing his electoral agenda. That is, he brought in Sri Lanka military. He formed sort of oversight committees manned by veterans, Sri Lankan army veterans. <coughs> <clears throat> who have dominated. <coughs> he gave tax cut <coughs> unmindful of the <coughs> COVID and it had an impact on the Sri Lankan economy. Nearly one third of the government income was lost. 
<coughs> he introduced organic culture banned all pesticides and chemicals 40% of agriculture produce collapsed sri lanka is a import based economy and tourism collapsed because the covid restricted travel and remittances also fell because sri lankans expatriates they were affected the usual expatriate channels were not working so cumulatively the sri lanka was in dire straits unfortunately this president has failed though he was very successful as an army officer turned uh, uh, bureaucrat defense bureaucrat he has utterly failed sri lanka is in debt sri lanka economy has practically collapsed sri lanka exams were cancelled a uh, uh, few days back because they did not have paper stock for students to write their exams this can show the dire straits uh, country where the buses are cancelled tourist trade is affected uh, the dollar has as uh, 275 rupees when i was in sri lanka in 89 a dollar was 32 rupees now it is 300 325 sri lankan rupees so ours is 774 or 72 you can compare how sri lankan has value downgraded so the debts have been sri lanka has been going on with begging bowl bangladesh has given a line of credit for 250 billion dollars india has already given 1 billion now 1.4 billion has been sanctioned because to supply petrol and diesel two days back 50000 tons of petrol has gone to sri lanka india has supplied uh, um, liquid nitrogen fertilizer because the the organic fertilizer imported from uh, china was polluted now china has as soon as india sanctioned this 1.5 billion china has come out with a, an offer to sanction loan but it is going to be very hard for sri lanka in this setup sri lanka is facing the because 20% of the tourists were from ukraine and russia how that is dried up actually they are stuck there in nearly about uh, 4000 tourists are stuck in sri lanka they cannot go back and the tourism trade is affected covid is not subsiding and uh, so the uh, chinese travel tourists are not coming of course indian tourists have gone uh, resumed so india is trying to help out the finance minister had been to delhi three times the president had been there initially he has assured india india and sri lanka he is a military man so i take it very seriously sri lanka will never bother to take any action that is jeopardize india security india has an agreement with indian navy maldives uh, defense forces and sri lankan navy has a tripartite agreement which was there it has been revived uh, because it is combined patrolling of uh, india's extended uh, what we call eef zones eez of these three countries which cannot be manned by these two small powers so that uh, our nso has nsa has presided over a meeting of the coast guard communities and uh, now mauritius also will be coming this is the current state 
so america is also leveraging putting pressure because the quad is operational and india is a member so there is a tacit agreement of uh, the indian actions have a blessing of us because india has signed three agreements with uh, outside the nato india is the only power because turkey is the other power which is already a nato member which has signed these three agreements of total defense cooperation defense and intelligence cooperation with us this is mainly china centric but very much quad is involved quad is india has sent a very strong message that quad is not a military agreement yes stand also is there this is how india has sided along with sri lanka sri lanka has sided along with india in un voting if you see on ukraine he abstained sri lanka also abstained nepal also abstained uh, for their own reason but it is a very strong show of signal how the future will be this is how i see the india sri lanka relations shaping up thank you for a patient hearing